Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm Beck. I'm the Sustainability Environment Officer at the City of Stonington. Thank you all so much for participating in tonight's webinar on Designing for Resilience, hosted by the City of Stonington and the City of Glen Ira. I just wanted to start off with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners on the land on which we're meeting tonight. Now, depending on where you're calling in from, but for Glen Ira and Stonington, that's Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as extending that respect to any Indigenous people who might be joining us tonight. And we acknowledge the living connection to country, relationship with the land and all living things extending back thousands of years for all Indigenous people. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Luke Caffarella. Luke, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Luke's yeah, a senior perfect. sustainability officer from uh, the city of Glen Ira. Lovely to be here. Thanks. Now, we're also really interested to hear um, where everyone's from. So we're just going to run a short poll now. Um, just wondering what suburb you're in, what stage you might be at in your renovation, um, and when your home was built. So pop that in if you know those details that would be great and we'll come back to that shortly. Um, tonight's webinar is a part of the Stonington uh, Towards Zero series with webinars on various topics running through until June this year and it's also delivered as a part of the City of Glen Ira's sustainability program. Both of these programs support each council's climate action plans. So now I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight Anthony Demaze from Demaze Architects. Anthony is a fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects with over 30 years experience and specialises in residential and educational projects. He's known for sustainable practices and contemporary design and is passionate about design's positive impact. He advocates for, for sustainability, responsible resource use and urban renewal. Anthony is a contributing member to the Australian Architects Declare movement since its inception. In his spare time, Anthony enjoys helping his son uh, with his energy efficiency of his Thornbury home. And Anthony, I will pass over to you. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, you know, being on Zoom is, is a little bit strange, I guess, because we don't get to see each other face to face, but it's a really good way that we can communicate and, you know, get ideas and thoughts out there. So really grateful to all the people who have attended. Um, just um, while there was an introduction about me, what I'd like to say is that I have been an architect for a long time. I've done a lot of work in residential um, architecture here in Melbourne. We, I'm in the northern suburbs, uh, so Northcote, Thornbury, Fitzroy. Those sort of houses are not dissimilar to the areas that you're occupying, and we have done work in that side of town as well. Um, so I know quite a bit about uh, the joys and perils of renovation work. And would really encourage you to uh, use the Q&A function to ask any question, you know, that you want. Um, you know, my, my knowledge comes through experience and, you know, I've seen quite a lot and sure I can help in some way if you've got some, some um, query on your mind. I also encourage Rebecca and Luke to um, step in if there's something that they feel that they would like me to explain a little bit more. Um, or if I'm straying, I guess I'll um, listen to their to their advice. But tonight's really about getting a broad sense of the, um, you know, why sustainability matters and how we design buildings. You know, we we all occupy homes and buildings, and the benefits of those houses and buildings to being um, sustainable. Um, designing for resilience is the is the name of the um, webinar. And it's being brought to you on behalf of Renew. And I've been associated with Renew for some time and it's been going for 40 years now. And it's really emanated from um, a group of people who first brought solar panels into the market um, and then their work continued into other areas of sustainability. They do a whole range of um, activities, including Sustainable Open House Day, which I've been part of, and it's really interesting to see what people do and meet the people who, you know, endeavour to make their homes more sustainable. The people who who venture into these sorts of areas, I think, are the real community leaders in our, in our um, suburbs. You know, it, it's often the people that do do put the solar panels in, put in better insulation, 
indigenous gardens, rainwater tanks there. Their work encourages neighbours and communities to follow suit. Um, so I would just say to you that all the people who are attending tonight, I'm sure your leaders in your own streets and communities in some in some way. So um, it's something that you should be really proud of. Um, and with that, we'll go to designing with for sustainability and um, go to the next slide. So just some of the things that will cover resilience and why it's important. Resilience through retrofitting, and this is something that I will try and talk about as much as possible because I'm really passionate about retrofitting buildings. The fundamentals of solar design and resilience to extreme events, fire, flood and storms. Now, what do we mean by, and some case studies, I'll show some of our own work, but I won't dwell on them for too much because I think there's other stuff that's really, really valuable. Resilience, I, I guess, why it's important, well, you know, even today we had a very, very hot day. Now, whether it's unseasonal or not, we do seem to be having more, more of these extreme events. Um, you, know, you only have to open the paper on a on a you know semi regular basis to to see the sort of effects that weather is having. Having you know, whether it's floods, whether it's storms, whether it's really high winds or really hot temperatures, it does seem you know just on empirical data that we are facing um, a more harsh environment. So we need to have buildings that are actually catering for that. So we actually have to be thoughtful of, about that. We still have to bear in mind that a lot of the time our climate here in Melbourne is actually really pleasant. You know, there's, there's, there are days, many days, where it's still 24, 25 degrees. And anyone who complains, I think, about you know Melbourne's weather is kind of crazy because we actually have a really fantastic um, weather system here in Victoria, but we are seeing more extremes and our buildings need to cater for that. Um, so really, you know, it, it's something that we talk a lot about within architecture circles about, you know, how we do that. Part one, resilience in our homes. Okay, so what are we talking about? Disaster resistant, um, affordable, sustainable, sustainable houses. And what do we mean by sustainable houses? We're really talking about houses that are energy efficient, um, that are not placing too much of a burden on our environment, on our natural environment, so that we're having as minimal impact on, on the climate as possible. Locally appropriate, I would say this is really important. So knowing your suburb, knowing your street, knowing the orientation of your, your property, Knowing sort of what works and what doesn't work, I think, is really, really important when we when we're talking about architecture and talking about resilient housing, healthy and secure. This is probably the biggest benefit about having housing that is actually eco friendly or responsive. Is yes, the the ben there is the disaster resistant side to it, but it's also if we create environmentally friendly houses, we are actually creating healthy environments for people to live in. And healthy environments mean that we, we we are not going to get us sick and we're going to actually enjoy the environment that we create. And it's one of the real benefits of environmentally friendly houses. We're creating a financial asset. Now, I would say in Melbourne, we really value the size of the property and we really value the location of the property. I think more and more we will start to see um, things that are environment, houses that are environmentally friendly as being a real financial asset to people. And we'll start to see that people will want to have houses that are actually energy efficient and well located. If you're in the areas of Glen Eyre and, and Stonington, you know, as I presume you are, then you're in you're in a really great suburbs because you've got, you know, generally speaking, you've got great parkland schools, you've got access to transport and a whole range of things. So the suburbs that you occupy um, you know, the ha where your houses are locate, located means that you are you're really using the infrastructure that's around you and that you've got a really good financial asset. So investing in homes is a really good idea as far as I can tell. Um, adaptable, making sure that the houses can accommodate different needs. And as we age in our homes, being able to move and stay in our houses for much longer is, is also a really important thing. Whether we have young families and those and our houses need to grow and expand to accommodate the kids and and all of their friends, but it's also, you know, thinking about what happens when the kids um, leave and how we can retain those houses for longer. And scalable. 
so that different that we've got different housing choices for people that we we're not trying to you know create housing for two three children you know for five sort of adults but we're actually thinking about houses that meet different people's needs whether it's a single person household or a multi-generational house so resilient housing is all about trying to create housing that caters to the to the needs of the society that we currently live in Healthy houses are healthy and comfortable, durable, energy efficient, low embodied carbon. I could touch on any of these these points, but I, I would just really stress the healthy and comfortable aspect of environmentally friendly houses. It's really the best feature that we 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 can stress when we create healthy healthy houses. We benefit, and housing is all about the people who live in it. You can't separate sustainable sustainability from human comfort because if we're comfortable and we're not using lots and lots of energy that's really the the place that we want to get to durable without excessive maintenance i think this is really key every house needs maintenance and it's really important that we maintain our houses because then it, those houses are going to last for much much longer so but if we create houses that are really excessive, that require excessive maintenance, eventually, you know, it's going to be more and more difficult to, to be able to maintain those houses. Energy efficient, we really want houses that don't require lots of heating and cooling to keep those places healthy and comfortable. Ideally, we're using, we're using the sun, the natural ventilation, we're using garden spaces so that we're shading our houses and all those sorts of things so that we're actually creating an energy efficient housing. Um, affordable bills and, and utilities. We know that um, energy prices are rising. So by creating an eco-friendly house, we're also reducing, potentially reducing our, our energy costs. And we're creating houses that are ex more resistant to extreme events. So, you know, if you think about a house that's got a lot of glazing, it's a big house. Um, it's not well constructed. It's, you know, it's 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 a leaky house, shall we say? Well, you could expect to pay a lot more in maintenance. You're going to expect to pay a lot more in energy bills. So, if we create houses that are smarter houses in the way that they respond to our environment, then the the, the natural consequence is that it's going to be much more efficient for us to 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 run and much more healthy for us to live in. Um, resilience through retrofitting. I am a, a really big advocate for the retrofitting of existing buildings. And I suspect many of our listeners tonight or, or attendees occupy homes that are in, in need of retrofitting or renovation. The reason that retrofitting, I think, makes such good environmental sense is that the idea of knocking down a building, you know, let's say a perfectly good building and building a new building, even if that building is, let's say, a six, seven star building, it comes at a cost to the environment. Generally speaking, a lot of the materials that you'll demolish from an existing house will end up in landfill. And then the materials that you're that are being demolished are generally speaking the same materials that will that the that the new house will be replaced with. So timber, bricks, tiles, and all of those sorts of things. So that if we can have our houses live and occupy our houses for longer then there, it's a real advantage to our environment. It also means that we retain a sense of, of um, uh, community and we keep the sort of heritage of our existing buildings. And I know in, in suburbs like Glen Ira and Stonington, that's particularly important. And it doesn't really matter what period house, whether it's Victorian or it's a you know, um, mid-century modern house, each of those buildings contributes something to the heritage of the building. So retrofitting has, you know, two advantages. We, we're keeping that infrastructure in place for a lot longer, but we're also commit, keeping the sense of community for a lot longer as well. And it's also really important, you know, like even if you are building a new building and some of you may be doing that or doing a major renovation, in, in completing your project, it's never a, you know, oh, well, I've got my new building and it's a seven star building and that's the end of the story i would really encourage all of the attendees to think about their journey as continuing on past the renovation project or the retrofitting project because there's always more that we can do particularly around landscaping um, there's new technologies coming on board and there's always improvements that can be made and i would also say that 
understanding your own building, understanding, you know, the prevailing breeze, the way in which the sun works, which which areas of the garden actually, actually you know, work and get good light and where you can grow a tree or, 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 or a vegetable patch is really important to understanding your, your own situation. So it's never like you, you just close the door on this chapter. It's always ongoing. And sustainability in the built environment, in truth, is only one part of the equation. There's transport, there's food, and there's, there's you know, fashion and all of those sorts of things. So obviously, as an architect, I'm focused on the built environment, but there's so many other areas that we can also be sustainable in. And I'd also argue that um, there's lots of, you hear of stories of, you know, um, you know, clients and people occupying seven-star houses, but their behaviour is not what you would expect it. So they may still have long showers. They may still keep the heating and cooling on for long, long periods of time because, in a sense, they believe they have a sustainable house and that justifies um, the sort of energy usage. And that's really not we want, not what we want to do. Uh, a sustainable house is about creating the infrastructure for you to kind of have a low energy environment and a low energy behavioural use. So I think that's really important. And the importance of maintenance just can't be underestimated. Essentially, if you don't um, maintain a dwelling for a period of time, you're sort of putting a burden onto, you know, your future self or a future homeowner to have to do a substantial renovation. So maintenance, we're talking about, you know, guttering, uh, electrical work, uh, painting, um, uh, all of those things that have to happen around the house that actually keep that building in good in in a good condition so that it can be maintained for much much longer and maintenance is just one of those things that you know is that constant investment in time and energy that that that's really required to keep the building to a current to a, to a good standard the passive design measures to improve your building the envelope insulation windows and glazing the, the idea of passive solar design and active design measures. So passive design, what we're talking about is things that are essentially low tech solutions, shall we say, things like insulation and window and draft proofing. They're the things that kind of have, they're not, they don't rely on technology. They rely on um, the materials and the glazing and, and, and draft proofing. They're actually really valuable things to do. And they're the first things that you should look at when you're retrofitting or renovating an existing house is to try and get those, what I would term low tech solutions in, in place because they have really good long-term benefits for any dwelling, whether it's new or retrofitting. I would do that always as the first step. The active measures like efficient appliances, yes, heaters and cooler, heating and cooling, of course, but, and also solar panels and things like that. They're the sort of active systems that you would use and you would also always choose low um, units that um, don't require a lot of energy to use, but also um, with solar panels and things like that, which generate energy. Um, getting off gas, more and more we're seeing a move away from gas because it's a fossil fuel and becoming all electric. So particularly in older homes, that can be difficult. Um, but it's really, you know, an important step to creating a low energy house. So typically in an older house, you might find that the heating heating um, is uses gas, hot water systems, and typically the cooling systems. So, you know, in our own house, we have gas and we're, we're slowly getting off. We've gotten off um, the hot water system and we've changed the heating system and we've now only got the gas cooker left, which will change over in the new year. So you kind of need a program in place to how you make these changes. Any questions, um, Rebecca and Luke? Um, just around the healthy home that you were talking about in the first kind of section and I guess getting off gas sort of feeding into that as well. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that gas contributes to an unhealthy environment within, within houses um, and there's, you know, the, there's a lot of cooks who particularly like gas because of the the flame, but there's also an increasing number of chefs that are using induction um, cooktops to demonstrate that induction cooktops are just as good as um, gas um, burners. So in terms of the health 
it's mainly around the cooktops that gas is seen as a as not a healthy solution. So there's a bit of a push to to change that. Um, so even though you're most of you will be doing a renovation and um, the, the um, ideas around passive solar design are still really really important. Now, Passive solar design is more or less what a person like me, I was trained in the you know, mid-1980s at Melbourne University, and passive solar design sort of emanates from you know, the, 70s, the 60s and 70s as a design approach to the environment. Um, and it's really about using the local environment. It's about using the change in temperature that occurs between day and night it's generally speaking, hotter during the day and cooler at night. Um, obviously, there's sunshine during the day and there's no sunshine at night. There's also a natural tendency for ventilation through breezes and through just ventilation because of how windows are located. Um, and so by using just the idea that the temperature changes between day and night and changes at different seasons, we are creating the ideas that we create houses that respond to that to those conditions. So it, it's kind of saying we know that the seasons have this um, these changes and that we know that the sun is higher in summer and lower in winter, and we know that there are these um, seasonal differences um, between summer and winter. So how do we create housing that actually accommodates that? And with that in mind, you know, many architects have interpreted that, or many building owners, in fact, not just architects, have interpreted that approach, that idea, you know, in, in oh so many ways. So it's not a fixed way of doing it. It's really open to designers to respond to the environment in, such, in, in any way they, they want. Again, the benefits are, are, are to create a more energy efficient home, the health and affordable and sustainable. So the main principles um, is that the houses are designed for the climate and we use passive heating and cooling. We understand the orientation of our houses. So in, in the Southern Hemisphere, we orient, generally speaking, we orient the um, living rooms to the north. And typically we would put our um, bedrooms um, and bathrooms and things like that um, to the Southern side. We use thermal mass. So thermal mass is things like concrete um, slabs, which can absorb the winter sun and then re-radiate it at night when we need that heat a little bit. Um, and insulation is really having a really good fabric around the building, a really good sort of cloak around the, the building so that we're actually um, preventing the heat from escaping during winter and we're preventing the heat from coming inside during summer. There's been so many advances in glazing. So glazing when, you know, 30 years ago, it was essentially, you know, three mil thick glazing. Now we've got double glazing, we've got much thicker glazing, and we've also got glazing that can resist um, solar heat gain and things like that. So, you know, one area that's really advanced quite a lot is, is glazing and windows in particular. Shading is one of the real hallmarks of um, uh, environmentally friendly design and particularly passive solar design. And that's really about shading our sun, our, our buildings from the hot summer sun, uh, but still allowing the, the warm winter sun to enter into our buildings. Ventilation is really, really important in, in, in um, passive solar design because we really want to use, if let's say it's a hot day like today, today was a particularly hot day, and we know that it's going to go down to, I mean, it may not go down to sort of 16 degrees tonight, but we know that the temperature will drop quite significantly today, tonight. So we want to be able to open our buildings up um, to let that ventilation come through the building and cool that hot interior if it's gotten hot during the day. So we really want to get those breezes coming across through the building. So that's about locating windows and having um, skylights that just really allow the building to breathe at night. So we're really using the difference between day and night to our, to our best effect. Condensation is something that's really critical in contemporary homes. It's become a problem and it 
it come, you know, we end up having mould if we don't control this specific aspect of, um, of um, you know, what happens naturally in the environment. And it's really about not getting that cross ventilation and not getting light into our spaces that creates this effect. You do see it more often in larger houses than you do in smaller, more compact homes. Anthony, uh, can I ask, we've just got a question from the Q&A uh, from Roger. Uh, in a brick veneer house built in the mid 70s with large window to wall area, would it be better to add double glazing or wall insulation as the biggest advantage? Um, the thing you have to remember about any change that you make, you, you want to try and do the whole building. So unfortunately, my answer to the question is, is you have to do both if you want to get the benefits of good, good passive solar design. If you did one and not the other, there will be an improvement, but it's a little bit like having a jumper with a hole in it if you don't do both. Now, that doesn't mean um, for the owner has to go out and spend all of their money, you know, all in one go. If they can only afford to do one, they do one. But they'll only get the real benefit when they've done the whole house, truth be known. So to answer your question specifically, if I had to choose one over the other, I would do the insulation first, okay? Because that's the slightly harder job to do. And then you would do the windows as a second, as a second option, as the second part of that equation. So I hope I have answered that question. Um, we'll just talk a little bit now. I know that everyone's in Melbourne and we have eight. So it's really important that we have different climates. So I think we're in climate zone seven in, in, in Melbourne. And again, I just really stress something that I think we're really blessed with in Melbourne is that we actually have a really good, a really good um, temperate um, climate here. So even in winter, while we might complain about it being cold, or we might complain about the fact that we have four seasons in one day and all of those sorts of things, we actually, generally speaking, have really good climate because most of the time, you know, it's around 20, 25 degrees, you know, depending on the season and so forth. But so we're really blessed to have houses that can actually be quite open to the garden and to the environment. We don't have the harsh conditions of northern Australia, we don't have the really cold conditions of, you know, Tassie and those sorts of places. So we're really lucky to be able to, to enjoy the sort of climates that we have. But we do have, we're increasingly having these extreme temperatures like today um, that we need to cater for. So really understanding your, your specific area and your specific location really is really important. So massive solar heating. I mean, this this diagram is is you know where you've got the summer. I'm 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 going to assume um, that most people know that in summer the 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 sun is much higher in the air and it's also much more intense. So the effect of having an eave, let's say two feet wide or six six hundred millimeter wide eave does a lot of the hard work for you in that it, it stops the summer sun getting onto those windows and preventing the house from heating up. In winter, in winter, the sun is much lower. It's about 28 degrees, I think, in Melbourne. And it means that that sun can really penetrate really deeply into the, into the main living areas. And that summer sun, and you can see in this little diagram, we've got um, a slab on ground that summer sun over, over the course of the day can really heat that slab up and that heat can re-radiate into that living space at night, okay? So that's what we talk about when we talk about passive solar design or passive, or sorry, thermal mass. That's what we're talking about. We're really using the effects of different conditions in summer and winter to our advantage. So this is a little house we designed in in, in Thornbury, where you know we're, we're actually just showing, you know, so that uh, you know when you talk to your designer or your architect, these are the sorts of diagrams, or you know, they should be aware of is just how the the building responds to its environment. It seems basic, it seems really normal to do, but you know, many times we're seeing you know buildings that don't really take into account just that very simple motion of you know the sun rises in in the east. You know, it, it travels northwards, 
and then sets in the west. So designing windows and doors and um, the, to cater for that, that natural movement of sun during the day is really, really critical. Um, passive cooling. Um, the main thing about passive cooling is, is really having that shading device. You know, I can't talk highly enough of having uh, an eave, an overhang on your houses. Now, a lot of you have got existing houses, so I suspect that most of you do have eaves, but having sun shading, having vegetation, deciduous vegetation in and around the building, pergolas and things like that really prevent that. What you're trying to do is prevent the sun from hitting the fabric of the building, hitting the windows and walls of the building as best you can so that you're really taking away that heat off the, off the main facades. Having cross ventilation, opening doors and windows is really, really critical because as I was saying earlier, you know, the temperature cools down at night and it cools down during the day as well when a cool change comes in. You get the prevailing breezes from the southwest or sometimes from the southeast. So you, you, know, you wanna really capture those changes as best you can so that you can open and close your house as needed. Talk about passive solar design, it really requires an active user to really make the best use of those things. So these diagrams are really showing the orientation. Hot winds typically in Melbourne come from the north. Um, so these diagrams are showing pergolas on the northern side to sort of protect that facade. And we're getting those cold breezes typically from the southeast and southwest. So those nice cool changes that happen towards the late end of the day um, and when a, you know, a cold front comes through. So we're, we're trying to create houses that respond to those natural conditions. Many of you, um, you know, if you're doing, designing a new house and we're, we're talking about passive solar design and I'm at university um, and we're doing an assignment, you know, we would orient our living rooms to the north um, and we would put our um, sleeping quarters to the south. One thing I would say about that, many of you will be in existing houses and you don't have that advantage, let's say. You don't, you know, your living rooms may face south, they may face west, they may face east. There's a whole, you know, truth be known, there's a lot of houses that don't face that ideal, don't have that ideal orientation. That by no means means that you don't take advantage of passive solar design because even a western facing, you know, living room it can be a really beautiful place to have. It's just that you need to be aware of that orientation and cater for that. So for instance, if you've got a west facing living room, if it's an existing house, then obviously it's gonna get very hot in summer if you've got lots of glass. So you're gonna to have to think much more about sun shading and how to restrict the sun coming in. It's also, you know, if you do have a west facing um, living room as an example, that for you know six to nine months of the year, you've actually got a really good house because you, you've got that really nice aspect when the sun is setting. So whilst we talk about the sort of rules about passive solar design, you know, any orientation can be made to work in your favor. It's just really understanding what's happening and designing to suit. Similarly, if it's a south facing living room, it's same thing, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, that doesn't mean that you take, you throw the rule book out. It's just that you need to understand what's happening in that particular set of circumstances and how you design to accommodate that. Images like this are very much about passive solar design where creating these areas, you know, you can see them, you know, a, a couple there in their house. I presume that's in, I don't know, Northcote or, or an inner suburb somewhere. They're, they're, they're really using gardens and those spaces in between the garden and the indoors because you know creating those shaded areas are actually really beneficial because they create spaces that you can occupy for long periods of time. So those veranda spaces, those areas underneath pergolas where there's natural vegetation, a place to eat, become really, really important spaces in passive solar design. Don't, it's a really good way of connecting buildings to the, to the natural environment. So I'd really encourage that natural elements like trees and vines to block out the sun um, and also give a sense of delight to the house, I think is really, really, really critical. Now, ask Rebecca and Luke if they have any questions.
Yeah, uh, we've got a question in the chat, actually, Anthony. Sure. Um, from Eva, uh, if retrofitting double glazing is very expensive, would you recommend external canvas blinds or coatings on the window to reduce some sun? Um, look, I would I would say the double glazing would be the better way to go. Um, if if you if that's an unaffordable option, then I definitely think the um, sun shading on the re on the outside of the building. I'm not a big fan of um, putting films onto glazing for the for the simple idea that what I was saying earlier is that we actually have really good days here in Melbourne. And so if you own if you have single glazing and you don't you can't afford to change it over to double glazing, I would be encouraging um, you know really good quality blinds on the inside and sunshade sun shading on the outside. So that during those days which are actually really pleasant, you can actually open up the sun shading and you can open up the curtains and let that light in. But in those extreme events, you can put the sun shading down and when it's cold inside, you can use the um, you can use the curtains and blinds to sort of keep the heat in. The other thing I would say if they if if I've understood the question correctly, is draft proofing is is a really important thing. If so, if it's an older building and it's got sort of older windows. Um, typically, there will be a lot of gaps in and around the windows. So if you can draft proof those um, windows, you'll go a long way to creating a more healthy and sustainable house. Can I follow up on that, Anthony, by asking with draft proofing those windows, is it things like sort of applying weather stripping mm. into the, the frame, into the sort of underneath the frame? What other sort mm. of things could be done? Um, the, the, so... Um, if you think about just in, in just the logic of it, the whole, generally speaking, older homes are very drafting, right? And I'll explain a little bit historically as to why that's the case. Essentially, um, in Australia, we built houses that were very leaky because we, in the very old times, we, we were used to use wood stoves, right? And wood stoves were smoky, they were hot. They, were, they were kind of created a lot of carbon monoxide and so forth. So actually having a leaky house was kind of worked to your advantage. I don't, I don't know whether they went and designed it in this way, but that's the effect of it. So in a sense, by having a leaky house, it created the opportunity for air to come in, fresh air to come in whilst um, there was this sort of heating system occurring, so chimneys and things like that. Um, as we changed to gas and oil, you know, different types of heating, the same thing. We had effectively a fairly cheap form of heating for a long period of time. So having a leaky house was kind of to our advantage, right? Now, when energy prices are much higher and we're, we're, we're more interested in sustainability, having a leaky house is not a great idea. So in a sense, in an older house, there are, there are not just gaps around the windows, there are air vents, there are gaps underneath the door um, where power points are located, uh, where light, down lights are located in the ceilings. They're all gaps in and around the building that and we're trying to now seal up as best we can. In, in windows and doors, sorry, I've gone a bit astray here, but so, but in windows and doors, it's typically around the opening. It's where you've got an awning, it opens and it closes. And typically if it's timber on timber, there's, there's always going to be a gap there. So the way we deal with that is by putting in weather strips, which is basically, um, you know, um, um, polycarbonate and it would just compress um, against each other. But it's also around the frame that you need to consider. Around the outside of the frame is also a potential for a leak. So it's, in simple terms, it's generally speaking where the, the window and door is opening, but it's also around the frame as where those leaks can occur. Just on that point, um, there's a lot of talk about insulation and insulation is really important when we're retrofitting existing houses. But I would also argue that, that making the, our buildings more airtight is, is also really important. And a really simple way to understand that is if you think about you're in a cold, you know, the human body, we're, we're outside and, you know, we could put a nice thick woolly jumper on. That would be one way of staying warm. But if you also think about what would happen if we put on a really lightweight jacket and we pulled it really tight, you know, around the collar 
and around the sleeves and around the waist, it's also another way that we can retain heat, okay? Because when that air is not escaping as quickly as possible, as quickly as it could. So if we combine insulation with air tightness, we're really doing ourselves a huge favor, yeah? Have I answered your question, Luke? Or I can't? No, that's good. I, it's, uh, no, that's good with the weather stripping and, and checking around the window frame for gaps and, and air leaks like that. Um, landscaping, I just would encourage landscaping is one of the most, you know, really important things that we can do, particularly in the sort of sorts of areas that the attendees are, um, water guard, rain, rain gardens, permeable surfaces, plants that create shade. I mean, I'm sure many of the attendees have got, um, are really, you know, really interested in their gardens, but what they do is they create an environment in which the buildings live in. So a building is not sitting in a, on its block of land in isolation it sits in an eco in an in an environment you know that that supports that house so having vegetation and lawn really helps create the sort of environment that is healthy for people to live in from a psychological point of view as much as anything i have to say um so insulation like insulation is probably you know number one you know when i when i've graduate, I think the, which, you know, sort of 87, I think it was 88. Um, I think the building code at that time only required insulation above the ceiling, if, I, if memory serves me correctly. I don't think it actually required wall insulation. And in the sort of 30 years since then, you know, we've seen just massive changes in the way that we deal with housing. So my point is there's been a trend towards creating healthier more sustainable homes over the last 30 years, if you know you want to use me as a, a sort of a guide. And we're going to see that trend continue. So this change that's occurring in our buildings to being more, more energy efficient, um, more environmentally friendly, more healthy for people to live in is a trend that's been going on for some time. So I imagine whoever's sitting here in the, you know, in the next 30 years will be talking about other innovations that we, you know, that we we can't even imagine. So, you know, we all belong, we all are partaking in a, in a trend to making our houses more healthy and more sustainable. What I want to show about this diagram with the insulation is that you've got to think of uh, a building as having six sides, four walls around the perimeter in simple terms, a roof and a, and a floor. All of those sides matter as, you know, they, they all matter. We can't just insulate the ceiling and think that that's okay. We can't just insulate the floor and think that that's okay. It's really important that we think of the whole building when we think about um, insulation and we think about environment um, sustainability. Just doing one bit of it helps, but it's ultimately not going to provide the kind of benefits that you want. The priorities are, are obviously the walls and ceilings, but equally the floors are just as important. Also, I would say is good quality insulation is really important. So R is a is a the higher the R value, the higher the benefit. Um, and it's also really important that when you're using insulation, that you're not you're allowing the insulation to sit within the wall or the ceiling as it should. It's not being compressed or it's not being compromised in any way. That you're really using um, the insulation, you know, to bulk out so that it can really protect the house from hot heat and cold. Thermal mass we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, thermal mass is really, you know, anything that has density, so concrete, bricks. Thermal mass can be your best friend. It can also be a bit of an enemy if you get it wrong. So a lot of Victorian houses, um, a lot of Edwardian houses, which have a lot of brick and is, are poorly insulated, for instance, can actually get really hot in summer. And then that heat re-radiates at night and the, the whole environment becomes quite uncomfortable. Used well, uh, and that thermal mass um, absorbs heat during winter and re-radiates at night, then it becomes a really good thing to have. So, you, you know, you, you're, you're absorbing that nice winter sun and that heat re-radiates at night. That's the thing that you want. But we also want to exclude that thermal mass from getting hot in, in those really hot, dry summers. Thermal mass is different to insulation because insulation is preventing heat 
from transferring from one side to another, from, from a wall from the outside to the inside of an environment. Thermal mass is something that can absorb heat and we're actually wanting it to absorb heat and then re-radiating at night. And the best place I would say to have thermal mass is on the floor. Um, glazing, I think I touched on that earlier. I, I, you know, I just encourage all of you to, to look into glazing because even if you've only got a single glazed window, sort of the, the, the sort of technology advances in glazing has been quite substantial in the last 10, 15 years, you know, just with better quality glass, smarter glass, you know, whether it's double glazing, better window systems. They are expensive, I'm not going to lie, but they are, there is a real benefit to having a good glazing system in your dwelling. And it's the sort of solution that once you've put in, you know, lasts a lifetime. So the way in which seals work, the way in which glass can prevent the summer sun from coming in, the way that double glazing can hold the heat within the building um, is really important. The other thing I would say about glazing is, um, you know, if, if we go back, you know, 30 odd years or so, you know, you'd see lots of, you know, buildings with lots and lots of glass. We still do, truth be known. But knowing how much glass you should put in your building is really critical because um, in simple terms, glazing and windows are the weak point of your building because that you know it's not as strong um, a thermal barrier between inside and outside as a wall. So the easy thing is not to put too many windows in, but equally we want windows because it gives us connection to outside and it brings in natural light and all those sorts of things. So a really critical decision is how much windows do you want and where should you locate them is a really important characteristic of passive solar design. Um, ventilation we talked about earlier. No, so ventilation is different from draft proofing. Ventilation is something that we want to encourage. So locating windows on either side of a house so that we can get those cross breezes and we can get um, vents in through skylights. So when it's hot, those hot air can escape. Um, ventilation is different from draft proofing. Draft proofing is something that we, we want to prevent because we don't really have control over drafts. And drafts, we're talking about under doors, around windows, um, through exhaust fans and things like that. Um, they are, in a sense, allowing all of that nice warm air in winter to escape. Um, and, you know, you're, you're having to replenish the heating and cooling in order to make up that, 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 air, that loss of um, air. Some of you may have seen in the papers in the age and things like that, you know, condensation, mould, particularly in apartment buildings, this is becoming um, an increasing feature of um, you know, poorly built buildings. Um, why does condensation occur? Condensation occurs, generally speaking, when you have warm, moist air hitting a cold surface. So you would typically see condensation forming around single glazed windows. So let's say you've got, you know, you're putting a lot of heat into your building and it's a humid day or there's a lot of moisture in the air. When that hot, moist air hits the cold window, the air, the water in the air will condense and fall down the window and onto the sill and potentially um, lead to mould. You're typically seeing it around curtains, um, on carpets and things like that. Now, mould is something that is we want to avoid at all costs because it can have really detrimental um, health outcomes for the occupants. So, you know, having buildings that are actually uh, have a good fabric around it, you know, what I'm talking about is walls and, and windows, generally speaking means that you're retaining that heat throughout the building so you're not providing those opportunities for condensation to occur any questions on that because i think it's a really important issue we just had a question coming anthony um around insulation that you were chatting about before um joy's wondering is there anything you can do to insulate a concrete slab that has obviously not been insulated in the construction process not not really. Not tr not really, unless you are prepared. I mean, 
in many ways, um, you know, a lot of English houses have carpet. Carpet was a form of insulation, truth be known. And um, uh, unless you're wanting to build that slab up, um, there's no way to insulate underneath that building. So when you're talking about retrofitting or renovating, there are compromises. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, if we, if, if we all think about um, renovations as improving what you've got rather than rebuilding what you've got, then you can make a substantial difference. And, and my, my personal view is that, you know, Melbourne has, you know, so many houses that are of poor quality let's call them one star houses for, for argument's sake if we could all raise them to four stars let's say then we will do a, you know we will do a great service to you know the environment and the people who live there so we might not get to seven stars but we can get to say four or maybe even five stars so and we know that there are compromises that need to be made and that's just life unfortunately but we can always improve on what we've got so to answer your question no, I don't think you can, not that I'm aware of, um, but that doesn't mean there are not other things that that person can do to improve their environment. Great. And on condensation, so we were talking before about like it's important to be sealing up gaps, but I guess at the same time, if there's condensation, it's also important to be kind of ventilating yeah, the house. It, and it's kind of contradictory, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's about control. It's like it's like um, condensation doesn't just make, you know doesn't occur all all through the year. Uh, um, so you what you want to be able to do is control your your dwelling. Right? So generally speaking, smaller dwellings and dwellings that have good cross ventilation um, won't attract mold. Okay, but if you've got a large house um, and you know. It, 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 you're not getting that air movement and you're not getting that sunlight, you're, you're, you're more likely to get condensation and potentially mould. So it's about, it's about having control over the environment. So having sunlight and having that cross ventilation in a controlled fashion, you're not going to open the windows and doors in the depths of winter, but you're going to open them, you know, when it's a nice day, um, you're going to open up the blinds on a nice day and let the sunlight in. So you're going to create an environment that's not conducive to condensation and mould occurring, okay? So I hope that answers the question. It's, it's about creating an environment where you've got control and you've got the ability to, to, to change it according to the seasons. The other thing is yeah, I would right. say is condensation on its own is not necessarily the problem, I'm not encouraging people to design buildings where condensation occur. It's really the mould that's the, the, that's the big problem. Condensation's normal. It happens in your bathroom when you have a shower. You know, condensation will occur on your, on your mirror. In itself, that's not the problem. It's that it's allowed to stay there, that it's not being properly ventilated that can cause the problems, yeah? Paul's just popped a question into the Q and A as well, around um, how do you stop or reduce condensation with single pane glazing? Yeah, not easily, to be really honest with you. And it it, it comes down to, um, you know, having you know trying to stop the the um, cold air hitting that that sorry the warm air warm moist air hitting that surface. The truth is, it will occur, and it's just not allowing it to sort of sit there for long periods of time, okay, that will that will potentially cause the mould to occur. Um, obviously, curtains and blinds help because you're kind of creating a barrier, but the truth is that, you know, it will occur and it's really being aware of it and just not allowing it to sit there for long periods of time because we're dealing with physics at the end of the day and, and um uh, and that that is a really strong reason why we need double glazing in our buildings because what double glazing does is it separates the inside temperature from the outside temperature and it creates that insulating gap between inside and outside so when the glass is in effect the same temperature as the room inside so there's no there's less opportunity for condensation to occur can i ask anthony if you on cross ventilation to you know uh, reduce mold and, and do an air change in your house. Is there an ideal distance between windows or doors that you can 
open to maximize that amount of cross ventilation? Um, well, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's a dimension. It's really what I would say is that you know a lot of large houses have obviously got a harder. It's it's much harder to get that cross ventilation occurring. Um, so you know if it's if if you've got a house that's say fifteen meters wide, let's say it's obviously much, much harder to get that cross ventilation occurring. And you might have to think about a kind of a thermal chimney, let's say, so a kind of space in the middle of the house where the, the ventilation can go. More or less, if you look at old houses, you know, they're typically about eight metres wide, roughly, at, at the most. And that's sort of what you want to get that cross ventilation occurring. When you're seeing buildings that are sort of, you know, 12, 15 metres wide, it's just much harder to get the breeze going all the way through, yeah? To make things a little bit confusing, there is passive solar design and there is passive house. Now, they are, they have, they share a lot of characteristics that are similar, um, but they're also quite different, okay? Now, I, we won't spend a lot of time on passive house, but I'm sure anyone who's watching this and has has maybe watched um, Grand Designs would have heard Passive House being talked about quite a bit. Passive House is essentially a standard of housing that more or less came out of the 1970s during the oil crisis in um, Europe, in particular in Germany. And essentially it's about engineering a house to be very well insulated, to be very airtight, to take into consideration its orientation and to prevent um, thermal bridges between inside and outside, to create a, a, a type of house that requires extremely very little heating and cooling to stay comfortable. Um, so just through engineering the building, you know, the walls, the roof and the floors, what they are able to achieve, and we've worked on passive houses, so we know that it's true. Um, you literally do not need, any, not any, but you only need minimal amounts of heating and cooling for that environment to stay warm in winter and cool in summer. So it's really lifting the standard of construction and design so that you get a house that is incredibly comfortable and very low energy. It's a standard that's applied and you need to have um, what's called a passive house designer working on the building who does a whole series of calculations and those calculations are submitted to the Passive House Institute in Germany for verification and then there needs to be um, testing done on site when the house is built to prove that you've met those standards. So it's really raising the bar of construction and design to a whole new level. Much harder to do in a renovation, but they also have a, if for people who are interested in passive house, they have what's called NOFIT, I think it's called, which is a slightly lower standard to accommodate those people who are interested in um, achieving a passive house in a renovation. I think we've touched on this before, but the, the resilient side of houses, it's just really, I mean, whether we're in, you know, whether you're in Caulfield or Paran or whether you're in Bansdale or whether you're in Mildura or wherever you are, we, we all face different kinds of risks um, with housing. Um, we, we, I, I would say it's fair that in sort of urban places like, you know, where most of you, it's different to being in the country. But it's really important that we understand what the likely risks are when we in our houses. Like, is it fire? Is it flood? You know, some you know, with with lots of areas of um, Melbourne, we live in um, special building overlays, which means that you know there's the potential for for flooding to occur. Um, you may live next to a nature reserve, which means there's potential for fire. But we also all face the conditions of of heat and strong winds. So, understanding these um, what factors influence your house, I think, are, is a really important attribute for all of us. I mean, today it was really interesting. We we know that there were fires out in the west, but and we noticed here in the office that 
there was a there was a very light smoke haze um, that was occurring, um, you know. So and you know, really feel terribly for all those places that are they're having bushfires today in particular. Um, you know, but we are seeing many more heat waves. We're seeing a lot more bushfires. We're seeing storms in particular. You know, trees coming down, much stronger winds. Flooding where I live in Thornbury in the northern suburbs, you know, about 15 years ago, quite a number of houses were subjected to floods and it has a really detrimental impact on people's lives. Um, so it's something that we really all have to contend with in, in some fashion. And I, I, we can't be sort of specific to each of you tonight, but it's, it's really about, I'm sure council has um, information on this topic, but it's understanding what risks you face within your particular community that I think you need to at least be aware of. It, it's really recognising, I think, you know, the truth that I think would be apparent to many of us that, that conditions are changing and those extreme events do have the potential to, to damage and create havoc. So having houses that actually at least acknowledge that or at least kind of respond to that, I think, makes us uh, just that little bit more safe. Bushfire resilience, well, I, that's probably one of the main risks um, that we face, not so much in inner urban areas, but anywhere on the fringe. We're doing work in kangaroo ground. Um, so we have to create, you know, for a school, we have to create buildings that are bushfire resilient. So we're not allowed to use materials like we once did. You know, the timbers have to be much harder. Uh, window frames need to be aluminium. You know, the way that we do um, guttering systems is all changed. So just so you know, there are different standards for different areas. So it goes under the what's called the bell rating, which is bushfire attack level. And where a building is located um, changes, uh, whether it's on a hill or in a gully and, and its relationship to forest changes um, whether you're a bell rating 12.5 or a bell rating of um, fire zone, which is the highest rating. So the way in which the designs um, respond to those different conditions changes. So that's regulated. Um, a lot of these things are becoming regulated um, in response to these changing conditions, and that trend will continue. As I was saying earlier, floods are a real issue and it may well be an issue for, for many of the people who are attending tonight in not, not so much floods in the in the sort of conventional sense of, you know, rivers rising, but storms and overflow. So having buildings that are off the ground is, you know, really a good idea um, just so that you can resist those changes. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit a little bit about case studies now, but Perhaps if I just ask, is there any questions that you'd like to ask Rebecca and um, Luke? Uh, there's one that's coming in on the Q&A, just around resilient home design, including, does that include having backup non-electric options for heating, hot water, hot water cooking, et cetera, during extended power outages? I guess with the storms of the last week or so where parts of the state, um, yeah, have had power for without power for up to a week? To be honest, I haven't heard of that idea. It's, it's not a bad idea, to be really honest with you, but um, you expect, it's an interesting question. I hadn't thought of it, to be really honest with you. Um, um, it's it's probably a little bit of overkill. I mean, but when I say that, then I, I know that just recently there have been homes that have been without power for um, over a week. So it's possibly something that I need to take on notice, I, I would have to say. Uh, the idea of safe home is really about, you know, resilience, I suppose, is about, is about pr protecting the occupants for, you know, a period of time, you know, for let's say, you know, a few days to a week. So under very hot conditions, what you're trying to do, let's say, as an example, and let's say there's an elderly couple living in a house, um, what do they do? What, what sort of measures would they take? Now, there's been discussions about creating safe rooms where, you know, you might only call one specific space within the environment so that they can stay comfortable. Um, 
in if there's the potential for a, a flood in their particular area, you know, what would they do under those sort of circumstances? What measures would they take under those sort of circumstances? I hadn't thought about the backup one, but I can see no reason why you wouldn't. It's probably not one I've heard discussed, honestly, but why not? I know there's some people with all electric homes who do have, you know, a nine kilo gas bottle for their barbecue or whatever, or even the very small, I think it's butane camping stoves for emergency yeah, if I they have to. I think it's a good idea. I just hadn't thought of it. So I just, um, I think it's a good idea. Um, I'm just going to use this here as a little case study and um, mentioned in my intro um, that my son and I have been working on our own home. So at, we live in Thornbury. Uh, it's a timber cottage. Um, and because we don't have a huge amount of money, we, we've, we've taken it upon ourselves to renovate one room at a time. Now, that does not mean that we have to do the whole house, right, to get the full benefit. But we've taken the view, or I've taken the view, to renovate one room at a time as a way my son's, you know, relatively, you know, just out of school. He's interested in building. We, we wanted to create a project that we could both sort of see through, you know, finish it, then move on to the next on to the next space as a way of learning and as a way of having less disruption on our family. So this is the front bedroom where we took out the floor um, and took out the plasterboard um, out of the out of the walls with a view of insulating it. So um, so what was a very leaky space um, in terms of you know, there was no insulation in the walls, absolutely none. Um, the glazing was all single glazing in that very simple little um, bay window. We replaced those with double glazed windows. We insulated the floor. We sealed up all the gaps. Um, we poured insulation in the ceiling. So um, the change is dramatic. So this is our bedroom. Um, you know, I can't, you know, this is me painting. Not very well, but my son's better than me. Um, and, you know, so what essentially looks exactly the same as it was um, performs so much better. Um, so this is it without furniture. So we then put curtains on um, and new lighting and so on and so forth. But the, the, the change that occurred from doing that in that one room where, you know, we sleep, my, my wife and I, is considerable. Okay, so when thinking about doing renovations and refurbishment, you know, what I would say to you is really scope out the project that you can afford, try and do it to the best of your ability, because there are long term benefits. But, you know, I would really encourage you to not overextend yourself in any shape or form because it's more important that you have financial um, sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. So take on what you can afford, um, but try and do it to the best of your ability so that you get the benefit. And I, and I would really strongly favour those low-tech solutions, insulation, double glazing. They're things that last a lifetime. They're things that you don't need to replace. Um, this is another renovation. You know, this is the existing condition. Um, look, nothing... Nothing terribly wrong with the renovation other than it was, you know, it, it was past its use by date, single glazing, um, you know, poor quality fittings and so on and so forth. So we renovated it. So this is much more of an extension to the building, but, you know, uh, good quality windows, good quality walls and insulation throughout, thermal mass on the, on the floor. So that's a concrete slab. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about where it would absorb the winter sun um, in, in in winter, obviously, and re-radiate re that at night. It also stays quite cool during summer, you know, by shutting out the thing. So it actually has a cooling effect. Um, this is it under construction. So this is a renovation. You can see insulation in underneath the slab. You can see that we're retaining the existing building. Um, so we, you know, had to improve the existing building. Um, put insulation in and, and change the roof and so on and so forth. But we're retaining an old building, a, a building that's, um, you know, in George Street in Fitzroy, a building that has heritage value um, and adding a new building to the rear that 
complements that existing building. Um, that's what it looks like, you know, in its current form, um, solar panels, batteries, those things that, are, you know, add value. Um, but the real value, in my opinion, is in the insulation and the, you know, air tightness, good quality design, a simple house, rainwater gardens, um, rainwater tanks, sorry, things that really aid and benefit the owners. And they've just got a small, you know, young family. So you would expect that they would be able to live um, there for a significant amount of time. The other thing I would say is about these older houses in established areas is, you know, you really do benefit from the fact that you are located in places with lots of really good resources, libraries, public transport, parks, and things like that. So these houses are not in isolation. They belong part of, they are part of the community. And all of these houses in Melbourne and in other cities and in country towns benefit from the infrastructure that exists in and around these buildings. So you're not working in isolation, you're actually part of a community. Look, just some more slides of buildings that we've been work we've worked on. So this is actually a low energy building which uses passive house um, technology to achieve uh, comfort. Um, I can't stress the importance of gardens because gardens have just a psychological um, benefit to. So this is relative. This was relatively recently when you know the building was complete. Um, you know it was complete about two years ago. It's much more established, and the owners really really love being out in the outside. So having a smaller footprint building and having a beautiful garden is, in my opinion, the way to go because, you know, we are seeing, especially in a lot of the newer suburbs, sort of large houses on small allotments, which means we don't have many opportunities for gardens. So in the established areas, which I imagine many of you are in, you know, you've got that advantage of having, you know, what I would imagine is really beautiful gardens in and around your buildings. Just some interior shots. This is, a, a you know, essentially a passive house, which is a, a house that we've done in Northcote. Really good quality windows, triple glazed, get the view, but you're not losing out on insulation value, um, shading on the outside. Um, um, blinds on the inside. A lot of this is really simple stuff. You don't need an architect telling you this. Many of you will know this. It's just, you know, doing it and doing it well. This is the building on the exterior. So we've got sun shading. We've also got um, external blinds, retractable blinds that when it gets really hot can close down and prevent the, prevent the, the building from overheating. It's just showing a little thing. <laughs> so there you can see the, the blind coming down over the stairwell, which prevents the heat coming in. So those really simple things of external shading make a massive difference to a house. Look, what I would say just in, in, in before we go to questions, and I hope I haven't gone over time, is that, um, you know, that sustainability is very much part of the built environment. It's about building design. It's you know, we all belong to a, a real change that's occurring and, you know, that change is going to continue. People who are involved in sustainability, are, in my my um, experience, are very generous people. They're very happy to share knowledge. They're very happy to, to, to you know, tell people about what they have found. It's not specific to architecture or building or sustainability consultants. It's very much an area that we can all have expertise in and we can all sort of contribute to. So I would encourage you to almost see yourself as belonging to a kind of movement for change that sort of benefits yourselves, but also benefits the community more broadly. So, you know, there is just so much information, whether you're on LinkedIn following certain people um, in sustainability or whether it's in your local environment, there's just so much information out there that you can participate in that's really valuable. Renew, I find really good because they are very pragmatic. Also, the sort of information that you get from local councils tends to be much more pragmatic, very user friendly. And I think it's, you know, a really good thing to see. So I think that's where I'll finish um, and very happily answer any questions that any of you may have. 
Thanks, Anthony. I think that was really great presentation. Um, really interesting. If people still have, we have answered some questions as, as we've gone along, but um, if there's more questions that you want answered, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. We did have one from Helen. I think it was the first photo uh, of the renovation that you did, maybe in Thornbury or I can't remember now, the, the, with the extension. Um, and Helen was just wondering what way that was facing. This one? Sorry, not of your place, of the other house. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, so that is actually facing, so if we go to this one. This one, is, yeah. Is that south? Facing east. Okay, east. So we, we didn't we don't get to choose the orientation, you know. We we don't and and but we've got these skylights which are facing north, so that brings north light in, and there is also sun shading on those northern skylights so that we're not getting too much heat. So, you know, if you think about a building, the building's always got, you know, four sides to it. So you can always, through design, make the best of whatever constraints you have on your particular house. That much I would say to everyone, whether it's I've done south facing living rooms, I've done north facing living rooms, done west. It, it, it's really understanding um, the prevailing conditions and responding to those conditions. Um, and interestingly, today there was, I can't remember if it was in The Age or on the AVC, there was actually an article um, about a young couple who had done a passive house renovation. Yeah. So was um, they were, yeah, they were, um, yeah, I, was, I read that someone sent that to me. And, you know, real enthusiasts, really committed to it. Um, and, you know, they're, you, you'll, I'm sure, if you start looking into the newspaper, you'll see these stories cropping up. And often those individuals, those sort of homeowners that take a real interest in their home and, you know, renovate it and improve it in certain ways, I genuinely believe they're, they're really important to our community because they're doing something for themselves, but they're also demonstrating to others what's possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have had another question come in. Eve is wondering, do you have a preference for type of interior blind? Example, Holland, Venetian, curtains, et cetera. Um, it depends on the orientation and the situation. So um, it's a really good question. Um, so if you have drapes, you know, you actually get the insulating effect of drapes, um, but they, they tend to be quite bulky. So my preference is for mod, um, Holland blinds um, and the sort of fabrics that are being used now for Holland blinds. So typically you have a dual system, a block out and a sort of semi-transparent system. And they've, they've actually got really good systems of automation now. So you've got, um, you can get a remote control that can um, control, you know, what position they're in and they work really well. Um, in, in those sorts of areas, say like blinds, um, external blinds, internal blinds, there's been a lot of advancement in sort of the technology and in terms of the use of fabric, the type of fabric and, and automation. So you can actually get a lot out of those very simple things like blinds. So to answer your question, Holland blinds, um, because I just find that they look neater in a modern house and I tend to do contemporary houses. But if you're the people who are attending are more interested in, in, in Victorian dwellings than you might look at, you know, um, a more traditional drape. And I have heard of people in terms of insulating, and Luke might know more about this than what I do. I can't remember what they're called, but they're like a hexagon kind of shape. Yeah. Do you they, know what I'm talking about? <laughs> there is a kind of honeycomb shape one. Honeycomb. Yeah, maybe it's that one. Um, so I haven't used those. They You do see those on skylights. So okay. um, on Vlux skylights, you, they'll have a, a kind of, they compress and then there's a honeycomb sort of thing. So again, it's 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 something that, you know, if you get on onto Instagram and, you know, or, or some of these forums, you'll, you'll see quite a lot of really interesting stuff in this area, which I, I personally enjoy looking at and think is really interesting. Yep. Great. Yeah, well, if there's any other questions, um, 
feel free to pop them in. But I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along today and um, thank our presenter as well, Anthony, again so much for all of the great information. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, uh, just a few final things again we'll be sending out a follow-up survey we really love to hear everyone's thoughts and opinions um, and really like to continue to improve our webinars um, this is the first webinar in a series our next one is next Thursday um, and it's about finding the right team for your renovation so if you haven't already make sure that you sign up um, and then there's a few more in April. So if you want to be kept in the loop, be sure to sign up to uh, the Stonington and or Glen Ira newsletters. Um, and Luke had a few things coming up for Glen Ira as well. So I'll pass to Luke to fill you in about that. Thanks, Beck. Um, yeah, we have, uh, they haven't been, they're not available just yet. They will be soon. Uh, we have some home energy kits which can be used to test uh, issues in your house where, that you can then take action with, some of the things we've talked about today. Each kit kind of contains a thermal imaging camera, a PowerMate energy use, use meter, rather, a thermometer, and an instruction manual. And you can borrow them from uh, one of the four Glen Iro libraries, um, just as you would a book, and then do your testing at home and then bring it back and you can make changes from there. Um, and then the other thing that we have is not directly related to today's topic, but in the sustainability area generally is the our EV Expo coming up on uh, the 17th of March, which you can check out on our Renaro website. Um, and if you'd like to come along to that, you can see some EVs in person and listen to some presentations and get involved. That would be fantastic. Thanks, Beck. Excellent. That sounds great. All right. Thank you all again for coming along. Um, and hopefully we will see you next week. But otherwise, have a great night. Bye.